Welcome to the Food Packaging Forum webinar on chemicals and plastic, toxicity and composition with Lisa Zimmermann, who is our guest speaker today. I am very happy um, to hold this webinar. We have a lot of interest and it kind of shows that this topic is really uh, very current and relevant. Um, it's actually our first webinar that we're doing in 2019. Um, and we have new software, um, fingers crossed that everything's going to go well. Um, but just for your information, we are recording this webinar and we plan to make it available um, on our website after the, the webinar in a couple of days uh, and also together with, with slides. So in case you have to jump out a little bit early, you can watch the whole uh, webinar afterwards. Um, before we get started and um, before I welcome our guest speaker, I would just like to say a couple of words about the food packaging form for those of you who don't know us. We are a charitable foundation uh, based in Zurich in Switzerland. We were founded seven years ago, 2012. And our focus is science communication and scientific research, desk-based scientific research, I should say. Um, focusing on chemicals and all types of food content materials and articles, so not just food packaging, but also processing equipment and so on. And we're interested in understanding the chemical composition of these food contact articles, uh, the transfer of these chemicals into food and the health impacts when humans ingest those chemicals with their food on a daily basis at low levels. Um, we uh, focus on providing high quality scientific information on this topic and we also um, importantly make it available to all stakeholders. So all the information is, is free on our website. That's one of our principles and it always will be freely accessible. Um, and in order to do that, of course, we depend on donations. So I want to take this opportunity to thank our donors very much for enabling our work and for supporting us and for giving us the freedom that we need to do our research. If you do think that our work has value, we're grateful for donations and contributions, and you can send us an email or go to our website um, for options on how to make a donation. Thank you very much. Good, so um, with that, I would like to uh, walk you through the agenda. So we have um, the presentation by Lisa Zimmermann on chemicals and plastic toxicity and composition. Um, Lisa is a doctoral candidate at the Goethe University um, Frankfurt in Germany. And Lisa, I'm very, very grateful that you managed to take the time. I know you've been very busy. This study that you published last week has received a lot of media attention and I can just imagine how much media work you're doing right now. Um, even though you probably also need to be in the lab because you're still working on finishing your PhD. So thanks a lot for taking the time. Really appreciate it. After Lisa's talk, we'll have time for questions and discussion. And we're going to do this um, the webinar way. So um, there's a Q&A interface uh, in, in the Zoom. Um, and we please kindly ask you to type your questions or comments um, into that interface. You will be requested to uh, provide your name. And then as we get to the uh, uh, discussion and question section after Lisa's talk, um, we will go through as many questions as possible. So please, um, please use the Q&A function. Good. So with that, I would like to give the floor to our speaker, uh, Lisa Zimmermann. Lisa has a master's degree in ecotoxicology in molecular toxicology and biochemistry from the University of Konstanz in Germany, so not far from, from Zurich. And currently she's completing her PhD thesis with the Plastics project um, in Frankfurt in the Department of Aquatic Ecotoxicology at the Goethe University. In her research, she focuses on the toxicity and composition of chemicals used in and leaching out of plastic products. So, um, with that, Lisa, I would like to pass the floor over to you. Okay, thanks, Jane, for the nice um, introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to present here, and um, especially now when I hear that it's the first talk this year. 
and this not too um, young year 2019. Um, as you already mentioned, um, what I'm going to talk about today is about chemicals and plastics, toxicity and composition. So what we know is that um, plastics contain a multitude of intentional and non-intentionally added substances um, just um, not too long ago, Kro et al. Had published a paper um, and um, found more than 4,000 chemicals which are likely or possibly associated with plastic packaging. So there is um, a lot of um, compounds we know in, uh, in plastics and we know their toxicity as, for example, their well-studied substances as bisphenol A or phthalates. However, there are also um, um, a lot of um, unknown compounds in our plastic materials. And of these unknowns, we, we can't assess their toxicity. And furthermore, this, as I said already, there is a lot of um, different chemicals in plastics. And due to this unknown, and um, there is a lot of also the mixture of all these substances are unknowns and there is only um, few um, chemical mixtures and plastics which have been studied. So the aim of, um, of, of this work here was to, to um, look at um, plastic materials and to find out which substances do we find in, in these plastic materials, what, is, what type of substance and what is their function. And additionally, um, we wanted to find out whether these plastic products contain substances, substances which cause toxic effect in vitro and um, concerning the latter, whether there are differences between different plastic types, product types, and between food contact and non-food contact materials. To do so, um, we, um, we um, obtained 34 plastic products currently available on the German market, which are frequently used by, by the normal consumers. Um, that were products of different categories, like for example, drink bottles and yogurt cups, um, trays and boxes. And they were made of eight different plastic types, um, as indicated uh, here on the bottom. Um, seven of them were petrol based, as for example, PET. And then um, there was also one bio based and biodegradable plastic, which was polylactic acid. And um, these Polymer types are frequently used and they contain different amount of additives. And in order to analyze them, we um, wash these products really carefully, we cut them and we ex extracted them in a solvent-based, um, ultrasound-based procedure in order to mimic worst case scenario. And then we used these extracts and applied them on one hand um, to qualitative chemical analysis by gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and on the other hand, the different um, bioassays to investigate baseline toxicity, oxidative stress, and endocrine disrupting activity. I'm going to start um, with looking at the chemical pattern today. And what we first did is um, we took these um, chromatograms we obtained by gas chromatography and um, determined the amount of features per chromatogram, meaning per extracts. And we detected an average of 40 chemical features per extract and a maximum um, amount of feature of nearly 200 in the case of one of the PVC extracts. Um, overall, all the PVC extracts had the highest count of chemical features on all the PET extracts, the lowest counts. Overall, in the whole 34 extracts, we identified more or found more than 1,400 chemical features. And then in the next step, we, we ask ourselves, OK, um, what, what are we actually um, dealing um, with? So what are these substances? Um, and therefore, we compared, um, we did a comparison within this database to tentatively identify these compounds. And we could do so for 260 unique compounds. This means um, when you compare it now to this more than 1,400, that eight, more than 80% of these compounds remain unknown. So we, we couldn't, we were not be able to identify with that, these compounds in this database. 
um, for the compounds we um, could identify or tentatively identify, um, we compared them with the um, chemical associated with plastic packaging database, um, which was published by Gro et al. And we found um, 57 plastic associated compounds. And among these were, for example, monomers, as for example, styrene, which we detected in all PS based products, as well as additives, additives as for example, flame retardants as 3-acyl phosphate, UV filters as benzophenon, antioxidants like BHT, plasticizers like DHP and D EDP, and as well as the um, more um, novel replacement for these older plasticizers, um, A ATBC. And um, besides these intentionally added substances, we also um, identified non-intentionally added substances as for example, 9 octa kinamide and d for 2 phenol mm. Okay, but what is that now? So we could only um, tentatively identify less than 20% of the chemical features we found in our extracts. So 80% remain unknown. But in our toxicity assessment, um, we also want to consider these unknowns and to assess the overall toxicity present in plastic products. And therefore, we took these whole extracts with all our chemicals in there and applied them to different um, bioassays. Mm. The first essay I want to focus on today is um, the Microtox essay, um, which investigates baseline toxicity, which means like the general potential, potential of the substance to have a negative impact. And here for, um, we use the bioluminescent bacteria, bacteria alivipro fishery, um, whose luminescence decreases with an increasing toxicity. Um, and what you see here on, the, on this graph is on here on this x-axis, you see all the different products which are um, um, summarized or which are um, yeah, um, sorted by the polymer type. And then on the y-axis, um, you can see um, the potential to inhibit this luminescence, the EC20 value. And um, so the higher on the higher up the dots on this axis, the higher the toxic effect of the substances. Um, so what you can see here is that two thirds of the extracts induce um, some kind of baseline toxicity. And to make it a bit more easy to follow and to, to summarize this graph a little bit, um, I summarized all these products by their polymer type. So now each of these dots here represent one product and the red line is the, the medium. And what you can nicely see here is that all the PVC and PUR products um, induced um, a really high level of baseline toxicity. Whereas on the other hand, none of the PET extract had an effect. Um, so in case for the PVC and the PUR extract, that's not so surprising since they contain a high amount of additives. So we kind of rather expected that. But what was more surprising or interesting is that also all the extracts of this bio-based and biodegradable PLA um, products induced a really high level of baseline toxicity. Mm. The next endpoint we were looking at was the potential of these extracts to, do, to introduce an oxidative stress response. And herefore we used an human-based breast cancer cell line. Um, and again, the higher up the dots here on the y-axis, the higher their potential to induce oxidative stress. Mm. And as before, all the PUR and PVC extracts induced oxidative stress. And whereas here it was only one PT extract which had an effect on, for example, none of the HDPE extracts um, led to an effect. Most potent uh, was one of the LDPE extracts up here. Um, and uh, the last endpoint 
um, on the um, um, on the in vitro toxicity assay I'm going to focus on today is um, anti-androgenic activity. Um, we were looking at anti-androgenic activity with the um, yeast-based reported gene assay, and what you um, investigate here is whether a substance has the potential to inhibit that testosterone binds to its um, HR R receptor. And um, here on this graph, do you see um, the relative um, percentage for the HRR inhibition in percentage. And um, in total, nine extracts showed an or had an anti androgenic activity. And here, by the POR and PVC extracts, were particularly active. Furthermore, there was one HDPE and one PP extract um, which, which had an effect. Um, so now I, I rather summarized um, the, the or I summarized the effects um, by the body polymer type, but I also said um, we wanted to compare different product types. Mm. And um, so I summarized all the different extracts by the product category, um, which are indicated here. Um, and what you or what I mainly want to stress on here is um, that among all the product types there was at least um, one with the toxicity. But I can also express it on a more positive angle. We can also say that um, among all these product types, besides this last category here, in the case of baseline toxicity, um, there was one product which didn't show an effect. So even though they are functionally exactly the same, they have a different, uh, and, um, different chemical composition and chemical toxicity in, included in them. Mm, another way of categorization is um, comparing food contact with non-food contact materials. Here example is shown for the oxidative stress response. Um, so here on the left side uh, are the food contact materials, that's the non-food contact materials. And um, what, you, what, it, what it shows is that, that overall there were um, more of the non-food contact material which had an effect on this endpoint and which were also more efficient. Um, and that makes somehow sense because um, the food contact materials are more regulated. However, what you can also observe that there are single products with food contact, um, with food contact um, which are showing an, an effect as well and which is equally or equally higher than some of the non-food contact um, materials. Mm. Okay, um, so summing up um, and um, doing that um, by showing you a, a little heat map um, and here um, you can the um, effects are showing um, are shown um, from Low, uh, low effects or a low amount of chemicals which are indicated in green, which is um, 0% to um, red, which means high effects or high amount of chemicals. And coming back to the um, research questions from the start, what, we, um, what our study shows is that there is a lot of different chemicals which are used in plastic. So um, products might contain up to 200 chemicals. And the majority of those is unknown and, of what, I, and what, of, of what is unknown we can't assess so we don't know what the toxicity is. Um, and uh, overall two thirds of um, the consumer plastics we tested contain some, some kind of toxic um, chemicals, so meaning they showed an effect of at, um, at, at least one of our um, endpoints. Um, here we're some plastic types um, show a broader and higher toxicological response than others, um, which was the case for PVC and PUR. And on the, um, on the other end of the spectrum, the PET, which didn't show um, so many um, effects. But what we also see is that it's hard to generalize. So there was it often rather dependent on the product than the polymer type itself, whether we saw an effect or not. Um, what I want to stress on um, is that from, from these results, we, we can't make any um, implications of whether um, these chemical mixtures affect human health. 
But what we can say is that there is a lot of unknown in our plastics and a lot of different substances and that we might not want them to be in our plastics in the first place. Um, and um, um, which I, what I kind of showed you with them by comparing these different product types is um, that there are products which might look, um, might look the same and have the same functionality, but they are different regarding their chemical composition. And this chem chemical composition is um, unknown to the, to, to the consumer and even um, all the actors along the market or along the whole processing um, chain might not know um, what, are, um, what chemicals are included in the product. So basically the chemical composition is a, is a black box to all of them. And therefore, um, because there are safer alternatives on the market already, we should, um, um, we should um, make that more transparent to, to make the chemical makeup openly available for everyone, for the consumers and also for uh, all the actors along the market share, such that the producers can orientate on the safer alternatives and design safer plastics. And the producers should make sure that they, the plastics they bring on the market are actually safe. Um, okay, so all um, these, um, these results are just presented. Um, are current or were last week um, published in, in, in Environmental Science and Technology, as Jane already mentioned. And it should be um, openly accessible soon, I hope. Um, in the meantime, you can feel free to, to contact me, write me an email, and I can send you a PDF um, of the article. And um, to just like maybe a little teaser, what's, what's going to come next? Um, so um, now we investigated what chemicals and what toxicity is intrinsically in our plastics by analyzing a worst case scenario and extracting plastics. Now we want to go, uh, move to more environmentally realistic, um, a more environmentally realistic scenario by um, using water and analyzing, um, analyzing the migrates to see what is actually leaching out of the plastics. And additionally, as I already mentioned, um, what was interesting is that we also saw a um, relatively high unspecific toxicity for all our um, PLA meaning these um, bioplastics. And um, in our next study, we want to compare different kinds of bioplastics with each other and also with conventional plastics to see whether these um, sustainably marketed um, materials are actually also safer than their conventional um, counterparts. Um, and with that, I quickly um, want to thank the, the working group at Goethe University where I did my lab work, which is shown here on the left side. Um, and as Jane already mentioned, this um, research is part of the, the plastic group that is here on the, on the right side and is sponsored by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And in case you have any further questions or want to have the PDF, you feel free to contact me. And yeah, now um, I'm looking forward to food for discussion and I open to nearly all kinds of questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank um, you. I'm trying to get my video to work again. Um, I'm not sure, Justin, can you, oh, great, good. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for, for an excellent presentation, Lisa. We have a lot of questions. So I think without further ado, um, let's get to those questions. Um, and for everyone who still would like to uh, answer, ask some questions, please use the, the Q&A uh, interface in Zoom to ask your questions. So the first question is from my colleague, Birgit Goyke, who would like you to please comment on the amount of additives in PLA. Um, and she said you had a slide at the beginning on that. Um, Maybe can we move back to that from. slide? Oh yeah, perfect. 
one. Um, ah, yeah, okay, yeah. I know. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't include them in, in that bar here. Um, and that's because I actually have to admit that I'm not really sure how many additives or what kind of additives you, I used in PLA. Um, but I'm gonna focus more on that on, in our next paper. But for this one, I didn't analyze it further. So I'm mm -hmm. cutting the amount. But since um, it's basically, yeah, I would guess it's somehow in the middle, but that's just, um, that's just a guess, maybe similar to PS or something, but I'm not sure. So, and maybe just a follow up question. Um, a PLA is a biodegradable plastic under certain conditions. But of course, if you use it for food packaging, you don't want it to biodegrade spontaneously because the right. function of food packaging is to preserve the food. And so would you care to speculate about maybe what types of additives could be used in PLA? Because you saw quite a lot of toxicity there. Um, yeah, um, actually um, we have a list in our paper um, of the tentatively, tentatively identified substances we detected in PLA. It's in the supplementary information. Mm -hmm. um, I have to admit, since it's 260 substances, I don't <laughs> remember them, them by heart. Um, so I, I would need to look that up myself, um, what okay. we found in there, but you can also find it in the supplementary information of the paper. Okay, so you didn't analyze those in terms of, you know, if they're biocides, for example, things like that. Um, uh, I would need to look that up, actually. I can do that. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I mean, I just asked that because actually a couple of questions came in, you know, what are your thoughts about higher baseline toxicity of PLA? And so I, I think people are, are interested in that. But it's good to know that we can go to the supplementary. Yeah, you can look, look that up in the supplementary yeah. information. There's a list of all the substances. Okay. Good. So I'm just going to go through those questions coming in. <laughs> Let's see how many we can manage. So Melanie Jacquet is asking, uh, thank you for the presentation. How did you select the endpoints and models of the bioassays? Um, yeah, so um, we decided to use um, two unspecific, rather unspecific endpoints, which is the baseline toxicity, which is a widely uh, applied screening tool and um, for the assessment of many different chemicals um, to, and also like to see whether these chemicals generally have the potential to induce an effect. So that were rather these unspecific endpoints. And then on the other hand, we chose um, endocrine disrupting endpoints. And that was on one hand, um, estrogenic activity, which I didn't show today. But um, as you probably know, there is a lot of um, plastic chemicals which have been associated to endocrine disrupting um, activities like as for example bisphenol A um, is supposed to be estrogenic and so um, we also included uh, these endpoints to see whether these um, mixtures have um, endocrine disrupting effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah I mean it's always hard to extrapolate from something that you look at uh, what we call in vitro right cell-based assay to whole organism. But there's one question here from Anik Chevillot uh, saying, which risks did you identify for the health of people with your study? So. Um, yeah, that's what I shortly tried to, um, to mention in, in the, at the end of the presentation. So for now, we just know, okay, there are substances in there which have um, the potential to do, introduce in vitro effects. And that's the, the first step we can do. And now we have to, to go into a more realistic or more into models which are more um, representative um, for, for humans like to look at in, in vitro, um, to do in vitro, uh, in vivo studies. But um, from our study, we can make a direct conclusion on human health. Mm. Yeah, one of the unknowns we have to manage. 
Um, okay, so um, a question on the methods uh, from John Dixon. Um, what were the extraction conditions? Solvent, temperature, time and sample solvent weight ratios and so on. I mean, quick answer would be you can read it up in the paper, but maybe. Uh, yeah, I can. That's um, the, the questions which I, which I get the most, I think, which is, um, which is really interesting. So, um, so the, um, we used methanol as a solvent and um, we used that um, because none of the plastic type we were observing actually dissolves the methanol. So the ground structure, the polymer ground structure um, stays the same. So that's why we chose methanol and not a stronger solvent. And then um, we, st we um, extracted it for one hour in, in ultrasound. At what temperature? Uh, the temperature was room temperature. Okay, so 20 degrees. Okay, I hope that answers your question, John. And again, um, Lisa um, has offered to share the PDF of the study, but you also said it was open access. So you, if you have oh, any soon it should be already <laughs> right now where they're technical troubles with it. Well, you can send an email to info at fp-forum.org and, and we'll help you if you have trouble getting the study in. Um, then Another question on PLA. So this is from uh, Kay Beckers. Um, in regard of the baseline toxicity, what kind of impact is this related to? As, as, uh, as you've worked with bacteria, I would assume PLA scores high as its base product, lactic acid, is naturally antibacterial. How is this related to other organisms? Any comment on that? Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, for example, with the um, we we also saw for one of the PLA extracts, we also saw an effect in the um, oxidative stress assay, which is not the bacteria, so that's a human-based um, saline. Mm -hmm. um, for the, but that was only one of the four. Um, and uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Well, I guess the question is, you know, one of the monomers or the monomer to make PLA. Ah, it's like the acid, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it could be due to residual monomer that hasn't been polymerized. That yeah, yeah, that might actually be, that might be the case that it's due to lactic acid. Mm -hmm. But um, at least from the, um, from the chemical analysis, we didn't detect lactic acid in there, if I remember it right. Mm -hmm. So, and I think we should have um, somehow be able to tentatively identify that. But um, if it's in there, yeah, for sure it might be due to lactic acid. And yeah. But still, it's a compound which is in there and which is prone to leach out since it's not covalently bound to the. Um, plastic ground structure itself. Okay, so um, one question here is again on PLA, what types of PLA did you study? I don't quite understand that. Are there different types? What do you of mean the, maybe the product types? Maybe. Product yeah. types. So um, in the case of PLA, this, it's also in the paper, there's um, a, a list included um, which, um, which states um, the different um, products which were studied um, under each polymer type. And in the case of PLA, it was um, a yogurt cup, it was a vegetable tray, a shampoo bottle, and a coffee um, cuplet. That was the four Good. products. Okay, I think that's, that, that's quite a lot on PLA. Let's move on. So we've got one question here from Nadine Boni. Uh, do you have ideas on decreasing the number of unknowns from your extracts? Is anything planned in this direction? Um, yeah, I, I think that should um, relate to if we do any further chemical analysis. And actually, um, we plan to do, or uh, we also did um, LCMS. Um, to, to see whether we identify any further chemicals there. Um, 
again, since it's a non-targeted uh, non analysis, it's um, really hard to identify the compounds if you don't know what you are actually looking for. So um, I think it's impossible to, to resolve them all. Mm. Well, it's certainly a, a challenge for any analytical chemist. Okay, um, then there's a question from Elis. Um, she thanks you and asks, did you analyze cling film? And if yes, was that categorized as plastic wrap? Um, yes, we analyzed cling film that was um, categorized as plastic wrap. Okay, great. Um, so, um, a <laughs> lot of questions coming in. Um, did you look at recycled PT versus virgin PT? Question from Mike Neal. Um, and no, we didn't uh, look at recycled PT. Um, there is a project running um, um, which looks at um, the differences between recycled and non-recycled um, PT. Um, but we didn't do that. And I just um, see another question which is related to that, which says, what consequences do you expect um, that the increased use of recycled plastics will have on the toxicity of plastics? So when in, um, that's also in this recycling um, topic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, that's a, um, really something to, to consider that we, um, when we recycle our plastics, we, we for sure we also still have this um, substances or this um, potentially toxic substance also in our recycled material. And um, it's hard to tell um, how they might react in the new product and how they, they might add, add up. Um, over the recycling steps. Um, I think that's um, a really um, good research question to focus on to see, to compare recycled and non-recycled and plastic. Yeah, it certainly wouldn't make it easier. <laughs> the <time>. yeah. <laughs> um, then um, there was a question on, um, that you mentioned that safer alternatives exist. Could you give an example? Um, like for example, um, we investigate or we were looking at um, four different yogurt cups and we observed that um, one yogurt cup was uh, showed uh, toxic effects and another did not. So um, that's what I mean with safer alternatives exist. So even um, you have exactly um, we have a product which looks exactly the same, which has the same functionality. Um, and there is no difference um, when the consumer looks at it and one, one is safer with regards to the um, chemical it, it includes and um, one, one isn't safer. But it's, I, can't not, I can't make any suggestion to it. I can't say now, okay, you should, should choose this product because it's safer than that. Um, because it it's really depends on the product, and mm -hmm. since we only um, analyze the subset here, um, um, I can't really make any suggestions from this little subset. So basically, the, you you'd have to do some kind of uh, biological analysis in order to determine the safer alternative. Yeah, yeah, you would need to um, analyze all the products or. Mm -hmm what would be best if there would be more transparency and you would actually see what, what is in there or on the other hand, if the producers um, had to assess the chemical toxicity present in the end product. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a question here again on the methodology from uh, Verle van Brandt, if I pronounced mm -hmm. that correctly. Uh, did you use fresh empty bottles or bottles that were filled and then emptied for the test? Um, in most cases, as it were fresh bottles. Um, and so we looked at, for example, we were looking at refillable drinking bottles um, and they were newly bored and they didn't, um, they didn't put um, any water or anything in there before. But 
we also, for example, we had one juice bottle, juice bottle we were looking at, and uh, or these shampoo bottles, and that we are not fresh there. We removed the content and then um, analyzed the product. Great. Um, then there's a, a question here from Anna Watson. Hi, Lisa. Great presentation. Were you testing, say, the same brand PT water bottle or different bottles from different sources and brands? Um, yeah, that's also a good question. Actually, um, we were um, looking at different brand, brands and different bottles. Um, yeah. Okay, so then um, someone's asking about brominated flame retardants. Michael Neves uh, wants to know if you found any. Do you have anything on that? Um, again, I would like to um, make you look at the supplementary yeah. information. <laughs> okay, so for, if you want details on the chemicals that Lisa found, please look supplementary. Uh, information. Then here's a, um, a question from Sitzel Duekaya. Um, did you talk to plastic product producers about what you found? Maybe they could identify some of the chemicals. To um, what I did um, before and when I acquired the product, I partly um, tried to talk to them, but um, most were unwilling to share the information uh, on the composition of their products. Um, and afterwards, now when or since I, I got the results, um, I didn't talk to them yet, but um, we somehow planned to approach some of them and um, but um, more in a neutral manner to, to say to them, okay, that's what we found. And um, but um, what we experienced so far is that they are pretty unwilling to share any information um, about the additives they use. And then most of them, them, they themselves, they don't know um, about the non-intentionally added substances and then all, about all these um, degradation, reaction and side products, which, which are also occurring or are generated during the production process. So they probably they would not be able to give us any information about these chemicals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I mean, you're highlighting a general problem. Um, yeah, There's a know. question from Marisa Maffini. Um, you use bioassays to test material extracts. Do you think this is the future of toxicology? What do you think is the value of continuing test, uh, continuing testing single chemicals used in the manufacturing of the material? So you looked at the finished article at the mixture, mm -hmm. but right now the regulation requires testing the starting substances and single yeah. substances. Um, I mean, that's probably also a topic you are really familiar um, with, Jane. But um, yeah, for my, my personal opinion is that it, um, as the studies show, shows as well, that it doesn't really make sense to just look at starting substances for, on one hand, because or substances that intentionally add to the product, because on one hand, it's only a subset you test then, and you don't test the mixture toxicity. And then using this kind of um, bioassays and analyzing extracts or detrates of end products is more representative of what is actually used in and leaching out um, of a final product. So that's the whole chemical composition and that's what actually is in there and what we get in contact to. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to say some more words to that. Yeah, I think that's fine. I'm, I'm anxious to get in one last quick question before I want to end the webinar. So uh, Martin, no surname, asked, the report essentially focuses on hazard of substances found by bioassays. Bio and in Martin's opinion, uh, this does not represent the real exposure scenario, especially for food contact materials. So he says, therefore, it does not reflect risk assessment. Um, and he asked, should this not be highlighted in the report and in the executive summary? What do you say to that? Do you agree with his conclusion that it, it's not the real material? Is what, what is in the material? Um, and what, but what is also, I mean, we also get into contact with these materials, like uh, might it be if something gets released into the air, 
and we breathe it in or if we touch it with our hands or um, or if we eat or drink out of it but um sure in a more realistic scenario to look at in, in the case of the food we, we consume is to to use, use food stimulants um in that study that wasn't we would have would have needed to take different food stimulants and in this study it was more the intention of okay, to see what is actually in there and then to see what gets out we will do that in our um, upcoming yeah. study to see what actually migrates out of it yeah okay so anyone who's interested in learning more about the actual uh, migration and also about the bioplastics uh, watch lisa's work <laughs> and you can also watch the food packaging forums website because we'll definitely cover um future work um, and with that uh, i would like to thank you for the many many questions we covered lots of them but there were also still a lot more that, that we couldn't get to um, please send us an email if you if you would like more information and so I, I thank you for joining our webinar is finished now but uh, if you want more content of this type uh, scientific sound uh, uh, well-researched scientific work on, on chemicals in all types of food contact articles um, then please have a look at our workshop, which is coming up on the 24th of October. It's going to be held here in Zurich. Um, I think Lisa is actually going to join us, won't you? You will be here. So if you want to meet Lisa in person, you can also come. Uh, if you can't travel to Zurich, then please join us uh, on the web stream. We have a, a live web stream. You can also ask questions online um, and um, listen to all the talks and discussions. And so with that, I really, really uh, want to thank you, Lisa, for giving us this presentation, overview of your work. Good luck for your PhD. And I definitely look forward to, to seeing the, the newest research coming out of your lab. And thanks to everyone for joining. Have a great day. <laughs>